All right. Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I am the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experiences at the Trolley Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today for another one of our 2021 programs in the Trolleyology series. And welcome back. Uh, I see a lot of familiar names and faces. If you're new here, let me know that in the chat too, because that's very exciting. I'm always interested to see how people find out about us. Um, this virtual series features programs mostly on Pennsylvania transit history topics or the trolley era or stories about our collection that you can experience from home. And we're keeping these programs going regularly, so stay tuned um, on our website at patrolley.org. You can find a full list of upcoming programs. Starting next year, we're going to do um, a little bit of... Um, it's, called, it's going to be called Trolleyology, the Extra Board, where we'll get some different programs in that might not be Pennsylvania related, but things that you guys will find interesting and uh, things that people have been offering to present. So that's very exciting. Um, I'm planning January and February right now, so expect an email from me if you have reached out to me before. Um, we're running into our busy uh, Santa trolley season, so sorry if I don't get back to you right away, but I definitely will. So anywho, um, if you'd like to present, please reach out, let me know. My email is assistant at patrolley.org and I'll put all that in the chat momentarily. And I wanna extend a special thank you to those of you who donated during tonight's registration process. We really appreciate your support. Um, you can also donate through our website if you didn't register during or didn't during the registration process, that's patrolley.org. And uh, let me introduce you to the museum a little bit. For those of you who are new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 by the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And the museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the route of the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. You'll find almost 50 trolleys here and electric railway cars, about 20 of which run. And we are now open with our fall schedule of Fridays through Sundays from now through the end of the year, and many of those will be event days. And Santa Trolley is back in 2021. Uh, tickets are on sale at our website, patrolley.org. And again, I can put that in the chat in just a couple minutes. Um, so now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dennis Kramer. Dennis has volunteered at the museum about, what, 27 years? Something like that. <laughs> in the operations and publications departments. Uh, he's also active with Trolley History Outreach, and he's given several in-person programs lately um, at local historical organizations. And this one he'll be giving in person, um, I think, next week. So on Sunday. On Sunday, yeah. So um, if you want to see him in person, if you like really love this presentation and want to go see it again, Dennis will tell you later how you can do that. <laughs> and there'll, be a few, there'll, there'll be a few additions for Sunday. Oh, excellent. There'll be a few more additions. I have to always make sure to good. You know, stir good, the good. pot a little bit. <laughs> awesome. And this is actually Dennis's third trolleyology presentation. And the other two are available on our YouTube if you'd like to catch up. And um, at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session where I will let everybody unmute themselves and chat with Dennis. But please feel free to enter questions and comments in the chat box throughout the show. Um, and we can read through those in the end or uh, pop in during the presentation. Um, and again, this program will be shared on YouTube afterwards, so stay tuned for that. Please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off during the presentation so that Dennis has all the bandwidth available and so we don't have any interruptions. I will invite you to turn them back on at the end. All right, Dennis, take it away. All right, Kristen, thank you. It's always a lot of fun to work with you here. And I'm gonna do that and do this, and we should be there now. Well, hello. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, this presentation is based upon a book that you will see at the end of the presentation. It was put together actually 21 years ago by myself, Ed Livebarger, and Bruce Wells. Uh, Bruce did all the wonderful maps you're gonna see here in a minute. Unfortunately, Armstrong County has made some very negative news recently, and so some of you may be wondering where it is, and I'll try to present a little bit of positive things going on here to make life a little more interesting. So, where are we? We are up here in the corners. You can see my mouse. 
you see Apollo and Leechburg and this, this little dark line over here, and you see a few rivers. You may have always wondered what happens to the Connemaw River after it leaves Johnstown. Well, the Connemaw River comes almost to Salzburg and joins the Loyal Hannah Creek and it forms the Kiskaminitis River. And that river flows <clears throat> the entire way to the Allegheny River near Freeport. This trolley line, I'm up here in Catanning. Actually, I'm over here on the other side of the river. I don't live in Catanning. This, is, this whole section is part of Armstrong County. Armstrong County is a rural area of about 600 miles. Uh, two rivers provided transportation opportunities for people since the area was populated over 5,000 years ago. The Allegheny splits the county in half, and the Kiskaminitis, locally known as the Kiski, has provided the southern border of the county between us and Westmoreland County. Yes, this is actually Westmoreland County over here. This is not Allegheny County. And this route has provided transportation for, as a river, uh, the next form of transportation came through obviously would have been small, small roads. One of the more interesting ones was the Pennsylvania Canal came along the Kiskaminitis River to the Allegheny and then flowed down to the north side and back in. And eventually the Pennsylvania Railroad and eventually the Pittsburgh and the Allegheny Valley R Railway Company. Now, why in the world did they pick a name like that? because the Allegheny Valley is up here and Pittsburgh's down here. Well, they wanted to come from here, from Leechburg, and make their way across the country to New Kensington and hook onto that line, which, which the Allegheny Valley line, which would have then given them access to Pittsburgh. They also had wonderful thoughts of extending the line from Lenape Park up here in central Armstrong County down here to Leechburg. Obviously, none of that ever happened, but we all like to dream a little bit. After the canal came the railroad and then the Pittsburgh and Allegheny Valley Railway Company, which opened in 1906, and it was leased by West Penn Railways in 1911. The map shows the line as it progressed from Leechburg up to Apollo. One thing you want to note, because you're going to see this on several of the signs in the cars, the trolley line never crossed the river into Vandergrift. The line was leased, leased, as I said, in 1911, but West Penn didn't actually purchase it until 1931. This is Barkett and Third Street in Leechburg, and that's where we're going to begin our, our trip today. Uh, and as I said, you can see on the car, it says Leechburg, Vandergrift, Grifflow Park, and Apollo. Well, it never went to Vandergrift, so the people had to walk across the bridge. The building behind, this is car 203, is the office back here. This is the offices for the U.S. Steel and American Sheet and Tin Plate Company. This was a steel making valley from Leechburg down to Apollo. There were several different steel mills on both sides of the river. And obviously, when you have work, you have a need for transportation. Uh, the building to the right, the one up there with the balcony, is still there. And it doesn't look quite as nice as it did then. And the balcony is long gone, as you can see in the picture down below. Kristen, is there a way that I can get rid... Do you see the thing on the bottom of the screen? Uh, yes, it's probably uh, because I sent a chat notification. So if you click on the chat, you it'll probably go away. <laughs> oh, there it goes. I'll get that out of the way. Is that, that should be a little better. Now you can actually see the building. And you can notice behind where the steel mill was, there's a nice tree growing there now. Uh, the mill's long gone. Off to the left right over in here that's where the bridge crosses to go up towards the Kiski school district area that should be a little better this map shows the mill this was the building we were looking at right here and this is the mill behind us this is the main street coming down and crossing the river this little arrow down here, and you're going to see this a little better as we move on. This is where this, this is where the company offices were. 
but this was the main this is the main street of Lynchburg. Here's another view. Um, and you notice in the postcard views that the wires in the poles are often missing. Black and white photographs were often taken very similar to what we saw in the previous image, and they were used as a basis for these local favorites, and they were sent away and colored by artists a lot of times to Europe, and the artists typically left out a lot of the distractions. Makes life a little nicer. Here, the photographers moved a little farther away from the center of the town. We're still looking towards the mill, but we can just barely see one of those streetcars up there. This is car 802. These cars were built in 1901 for the Pittsburgh, McKeesport, and Connellsville Railway. They were built to the Pennsylvania Broad Gauge, which most of you know is six inches wider than standard railroad gauge. The P and AV was broad gauge, so no modifications were needed when these cars were moved. They also moved some of these cars to Catanning, which were standard gauge, and they had to re-gauge all of those, and that's another whole story. This is car 204, and notice that they didn't really have to do anything to change the cars. In Catania, they had to cut the roofs off and redo them, but they really didn't have to do anything here at all because they didn't have any crazy overpasses or underpasses or anything like that to deal with. And if you happen to look at that car, it happens to say Connellsville on the, on the destination sign. This is another view of 204, and they were reconditioned Connellsville, and a lot of them, 11 of them were brought to Armstrong County, five for the PAV in 1922 and six for the Catanning and Leechburg in 1923. It took them a year longer because of having to rebuild the cars. This, by the way, is down outside of Connellsville. This is not on the line. This was before the car was moved, but I thought it was a neat picture of the car. So now we're looking the other way in Leechburg. We still see the building. We've turned around. We see the building with the balcony over there on the left. And that building housed a pool hall. There's a little clock over here in town. Towns love to have clocks. Ignore the little trombone in the bottom of the picture. That's, that's, a, that's a type of watermark. But down in this area is where the station would be, pretty much where they're sitting. Notice the lack of automobiles. We'll talk about that a little more. And there again, we have poles, but we don't have any wires. Here we now have a, a good photograph. Uh, the Hotel Twaddle, that's this building over here, dominates the other buildings in town. Um, for a while, it was a restaurant called the Twisted Thistle that was a good place to eat. This is, this is the now picture of it down there. Notice... The buildings, the cornices are all taken off the tops of the buildings, but the buildings are all the same. The most interesting part of this photograph up here is there again, there aren't any cars, but you notice that there's a double wire. West Penn loved to do this in a lot of places, and the reason for it was it eliminated having to put a Y anytime there was a switch or a frog anytime that there was a switch. Uh, frogs are used to divert the tracks or the trolley pole one way or the other. And this just saved a lot of hassles of losing poles. Those of us who have operated streetcars understand how nice this would be to never have to deal with a wire frog again. And this is the same hotel again, though this time they're calling it the Opera House. And there again, downtown Leechburg has changed very, very little in over a hundred years. I mentioned that we would see this map again, and this is a Sanford map showing the location of the trolley waiting room. The arrow shows the location of it, and it was located at 227, 229 Market Street. Address numbers have been changed since that time, but it was located right here, which when I took this picture, this was still the location of the Murphy's Music Center in downtown Leesburg. They've now moved up on the hill but the building is still there and this is the waiting room and the power office now what I find incredibly amazing is 
other than the fact that someone spent an awful lot of time building this box, this display of light bulbs. I'm still not quite sure how they have them all balanced together or whether they're taped together or not, but it's kind of interesting. But how many of you went to the power company to buy your light bulbs or your light shades? These were new, new businesses. There's a fan over here for sale. Ooh, nothing better than a nice fan to blow around that hot, humid air. There's a lot bound of land in the valley down there. Many of these postcard images were, as we said, were photographs. And a lot of times they took them either in midday or they took them in midday on Sundays. And that's why you very rarely see a lot of people in some of these photographs. Everybody's at work. Everyone is at work. There's a couple carriages hanging around, and we all understand gauge, right? Everyone understands gauge. Streetcar gauge was basically the prevalent wagon width of the local wagons, and that's typically how they decided what gauge to use. And six inches beyond standard was relatively normal in, in the Pennsylvania. Here we see a few folks waiting for the car, but there's not an automobile in sight. In 1900, there were about 8,000 cars in the United States and only 144 miles of paved roads outside of the cities. The other thing that I found incredibly interesting, I did some population studies and Apollo and Leechburg both had almost 3,000 people living in it at the time. The entire county had about 52,000. Today, Apollo now only has 1,500 people and Leechburg only has 1,900, but the county has gone up to about 65,000, a little over 65,000. So what happened, it happened in small areas, just like it happened in larger areas. People left the metropolitan areas for the suburbs, but they didn't necessarily leave the county, so the population shifted over the years. And this card where you can actually see the artist did put in the in the wire in the wires and you can you can barely make out the double wire there was one car barn on the system uh, the map was originally drawn for the company and it was revised and for a long time we did not have a photograph of the car but this is Leechburg this is the river this is now the highway, and this little building right over here, outside of town, is where the car barn was. And we now have, I now have a photograph of the car barn. Uh, the car barn was sold in 19 something or other, and It was turned, I'm, I'm sorry, it was turned into a trolley bus or a bus garage and then it was eventually torn down in 1961. But we will see some remnants when we get a little later into the program. This view is very near where that car barn was. We're looking across the river. This is West, this is Westmoreland County over here. The hill is Allegheny County because of the or, Armstrong, the way the, the river turns, but this is what's known as Hyde Park, and there was a giant steel mill over there. Just up the tracks from this, there was a swing bridge, and it's still there, that you can walk from Leechburg across the river, a footbridge, to go over to Hyde Park. And so people could very easily take the trolley line to the footbridge, walk across, and go to work. This is open car number one. Oh, sorry, that was the last car. Uh, this open car signed for Vandergrift. The trotting line never crossed the river. And patrons from Vandergrift had to walk down across the bridge to North Apollo to catch the ride. Uh, there's nothing too terribly exciting about this photograph other than the fact that you notice everyone is dressed up. People always dressed up whenever they went somewhere nice. Uh, it must have been kind of rainy or something because the motorman has, it looks like a dust jacket on. The conductor back here, the conductors in open cars had to walk the side rail. 
And so they hung on to these poles to collect fares as the car was going up and down the route. It was always kind of an interesting way to keep track of where you were. This United States government survey map shows the trolley line along its entire eight mile line. Now, what's so unusual about that is most of these USGS maps don't, I will go back, don't ever show trolley lines. So I'm not quite sure why it was stuck in there, but it is. And so it's a nice map to take a look at. Uh, these pen pilot maps were taken in 1939, three years after the line was closed. Notice, as I was talking about earlier, of how there's very few structures outside of town on either side of the river. Living in town and along the trolley line made my life much simpler. You didn't have an automobile. You didn't have to worry about it. So I'm going to get rid of all of that again. And you didn't really have to make that much of a difference. This map is a close-up of the photograph that we just looked at. And what we're going to see here is the trolley. If you, if you see my cursor up here on the left, the trolley line came down. It came through Keppel along here. And then you can barely see this little curve right here. The trolley line is going to start making its way back down towards the river. It shows up again over here, still on private right away, until we come into North Apollo. And then it's going to follow the street right away, the whole way through North Apollo. It's going to come around here, and it's going to leave again. It's back here. There are a few houses in here that we're going to see in a few minutes. And it came across, came down through here, and eventually onto Atchison Avenue. Well, this area over in here is what is, was known as Grifflo or Allison Park. The name Grifflo actually came from a combination of the last syllables of the name Van, the town Vanderrift and Apollo. And this was an amusement park that the company had owned for a while. I came across some more images. Uh, this is the park. And Typically, people went to parks to do several things. They went to band concerts. The trolley company actually bought a carousel and had it here. There was, there was a swimming pool. There were all sorts of fun things to do. This photograph shows the trolley company loading at Grifflo. Uh, they leased the land behind the present-day Dairy Queen and Sitgo Gas in North Apollo to provide a park for the community. Uh, it was originally named Allison Park for the family who owned the, owned the land. Uh, Henry Allison purchased Allison Park in 1922. He renamed the park to Grifflo Park shortly after that. And as I said, it was a combination. But these folks are all loading, ready to leave for the end of the day. And we have another trolley waiting in line, you know, first car, second car, waiting to load. A little farther down, we see Atchison Avenue in the distance and a trolley car sitting up there. This was actually after abandonment, but it's always interesting to go out and see what things look like today. And this is what Atchison Avenue looks like today. And it's interesting, you notice over here when I went down to photograph, there was a gentleman over here. It was Christmas time. It was a while ago, but it was Christmas time. And this gentleman that lives in this house was putting up these Christmas decorations. And anytime you start going out and taking photographs, especially around people's houses, people become curious. So it's always a good idea to have something in your back pocket that shows why you're taking the photograph. And I pointed to he had no clue he had no clue that there was a trolley line that went right in front of his house at one time so this house is this house and he was right next door and he was pleasantly surprised and I didn't have to worry about leaving Armstrong County in a basket we've now moved out into Apollo and we're 
just across the street from where the Apollo Elks used to be. And people were very proud of their of their cars and of their little trolley systems. And they would often send postcards. And so, you know, the lady in 1906, she just, sir, she just got your letter. Glad to hear from you again. This is our street car. The picture was very taken in front of the Elks on Warren Avenue. We'll write later. Um, would you send a picture of the local street car? Probably not. But it was a big deal to these folks. You can see the hill lines are the same. This is this is the front porch of the Elks. Here's a better picture of the Elks building, the former Elks building. They've sold it recently. And across the street from the Elks was the Apollo Steel Company. When I talked before about this, there was a steel making valley. So there was a steel mill in Lynchburg. There was a steel mill in Hyde Park. And there was a steel mill on Apollo. This was a very, very, very smoky, busy place. And traction companies were built specifically to provide transportation. I spent a little bit of time and combined some sand board maps so you can get an idea of what's happening in Apollo. The Elks building is right in this area. The trolley line, this is Warren Avenue. This is where the trolley is going to come out of and it's going to go up this way. These are railroad tracks accessing the mill. And the trolley line came up there, but you can see how much of the, the town was dominated by the mill. If you're familiar with Apollo today, you're used to coming down this way and continuing on to get to the bridge and go over. Well, in this area, this was railroad tracks, and this is where the Pennsylvania this is where the Pennsylvania Railroad Station was right in here. There's a senior citizen high rise over here today. This gives us an aerial view of the same thing. There again, you see the mill. You see the road came in this way. This is all just trackage and areas to load the streetcar. There was a waiting room in Apollo. Uh, the West Penn office was located at 222 Warren Avenue. It's called the Bruner Building. And this is the Bruner Building over here. And from what I can tell, it was this area because if you look closely at the photograph over here, as I was doing some, the guardrail up here the railing ends here and so that's the end of the building so this would have been this office section right here would have been the power company's office they had fair zones and you can see all, all the different little places they stopped this and we we all know that you know they pretty much stopped anytime you wave the hand at them because they were they were happy to pick up a passenger we come a little farther into apollo and notice that things are going to start to look differently. Uh, the four major towns served by West, West, West Penn Railways in Armstrong County, Catanning, Fort City, Leechburg, all contain many of the same architectural landmarks that existed over 100 years ago. The same cannot be said for parts of Apollo. Uh, this is Warren Avenue and Apollo looking north from North 2nd Street. And you see that this building over here, which was part of the library and the bank, is now, it's a, still a bank, but it's a completely different building. And these are all gone down this way. We are looking towards the same way if, if we would be going straight in either one of these photographs straight ahead. That way we would go back to where the Elks were. We've now turned around and looked the other way. And you can see that a good bit of Leech Apollo is completely different. Uh, what you want to notice on here is, there again, we have a clock. You're going to see this again to give you a reference point. Uh, it was the age of the horse and buggy. There weren't any shopping malls. There weren't any televisions, radios. There weren't any airplanes that early or, or computers. But there were over close to 2,000 trolley companies in Pennsylvania. We know what happened. And the same thing, a lot to a great extent, what happened in Apollo. They got wiped out. There's our clock. We've turned around again and we're now looking the other direction again. We're looking back towards the west. And people are posing for the photograph. We, we realize that when you took a photograph back then, you didn't move. It took a while to, 
get the image onto the emulsion and so it took a good while to figure all of that out and so people just kind of stood around. The photographer has now crossed First Street and turned around again. Everyone's looking at the trolley. We still see the clock back there. And this is First Street going this way. The bridge is down here to the left. Uh, downtown areas were vibrant places to shop. People came to town to shop and they did it regularly. And how did they get to town? They came by trolley. Uh, now, if you look at, there's, there's been some discussion and questioning here and there. If you look at this street, it's pretty obvious a streetcar hasn't been across this street in a good while. There's an awful lot of dirt there. And our records actually show, the, the company records show that the line ended there. There was a little bit of track farther on, but I don't think they ever went there. The artist took an awful lot of license and decided to draw one over there and kept the tracks going for a good ways. This is the Hartman House, the hotel was still there in 2015. Uh, see this nice roof? Well, in this next picture, it's gone. Uh, the hotel has suffered two major fires in its history. And so they tore off the entire top roof. Uh-oh. Usually, it was the automobile that caused the problems with most trolley companies. Uh, cheap cars and cheap gas. In Apollo and Leechburg, it was a little bit different. Uh, in 1936... The perfect storm brewed. There was over three feet of snow in the mountains above Johnstown. And in early March, it started to rain and it started to warm up. And then around March 16th and March 17th, it started to rain very, very hard. And we ended up with what was known as the St. Patrick's Day flood. And this it completely destroyed over two miles of the line. You can see houses are destroyed. If you, There is a video of it on YouTube. If you do a search for it, there's there's some video in Leechburg showing someone stood on one of the bridges and watched some of it go by. Uh, the water level at Apollo reached 47.2 feet, the highest ever. The company estimated the damage at $29,000, plus they lost their substation in the flood, so that was another $5,000. And so what they did was they sent the photographer out to document the, debt, the damage, and <clears throat> West Penn broke it to the local area in the Valley Daily News on April 10th that the line was never going to come back. It was gone. There was just nothing they were going to do about that at all. Here we see the car barn again. You can see some of the damage to the track here, but this damage isn't too bad. We saw the worst of the damage in the other photo. This is actually the roadway. This, this is the, the river has receded by this point in time. It's gone back down, but we can see that things aren't going to happen here again. It took me a long time to figure out where this was because we're looking at the backs of these houses. Grifflow or Allison Park is actually on the far side of the houses. The tree over the rail line, the rail line, this would be going back towards Leechburg, coming back towards us and going the other direction. And they are right here. So if you if you see my mouse, you see my cursor going around. This is where the houses are. The trolley line came, you can see it here over on this side, came around. There are the houses. It came around behind them and came over. The problem with trying to get in there to take that is just there's a lot of trees, a lot of private property, and I don't like to take my chances going places where you may not necessarily be welcomed. Different municipalities had different rules dealing with removing the streets, removing the tracks after abandonment. This is Leechburg. Uh, it's after the war. And the tracks and the brickwork are still in the street. Most trolley companies, when they wrote their original charters with towns, were required to maintain the track, the street between the street and to a certain degree outside. And so that's why you see bricks here and pavement over across. This is another view. The mill is gone already. Uh, it's only the 1940s. 
and we're looking this is this is the twaddle hotel up here this was the building way back from the very beginning of our slideshow that had the little balcony sticking out but you can see there's some people on the streets it still looks like a decent place to go shopping it was it was this is another view of Leechburg. Uh, the one thing that West Penn did do since they, the line was closed, they bought some buses and they started running bus, bus service that they actually sponsored themselves. Penn Transit was the name. This is where the car house was. Um, I know I'm not supposed to be driving and taking photographs at the same time, but it's kind of hard to find any place to pull off over here. But the car barn was right down in here. Obviously, the road is a lot wider now. And this little area is where they kept some of the sand for the car house. Uh, we know why you need sand to provide some traction here and there. This viaduct is still there along River Road. I had showed you where the, it, the line had come across Keppel and started making its way back down, and that's what's happening here. There's a little stream that flows under here and then flows under the highway, and the viaduct is still there. How long is going to last? Who knows? This is Apollo, and there again, Apollo still looks relatively vibrant. The bank is still there. It hasn't, it hasn't burned down yet. But you wouldn't recognize Apollo if you drove in it today if you haven't ever been there from looking at these. I thought this was a really neat little advertisement the company put in. Uh, you saw how wiggly the line was. It didn't fit on a map very well. Uh, Bruce did a great job of drawing it when he redid that. But the company put this out. And so what they did was they made it look like a giant horseshoe. It didn't look anything like this at all. But it, it does give you a nice idea of what's where. So here we have the car barn, the Riverview, Riverview district where it went up in the air. It's going to start making its way back down. Over in here is where the uh, over, that little overpass culvert was. Whoever Paul Magnus was, Paul must have given him a little bit of money to pay for the advertising. It came down past Grifflow Allison Park, turned, came into town, and here's our hotel over here on Warren Avenue. I would really like to thank all the people that helped me with this and who dedicated their time and efforts to collect things and share them with us. Um, I, as I said before, I, trying to do these projects by yourself is really a lot harder than it seems. So, so it's been wonderful. I've been working with Bruce and Ed now for probably about 22 or 23 years, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. So Kristen, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I can throw the screen back to you, or how would you, what would you like to do? Sure, let me, uh, before we get into any questions, um, I wanna thank you, Dennis. Um, if you do have questions, you can type them in the chat box or we'll let everybody unmute in just a second. Um, but before everybody goes, I want to let you know that we've got in a couple weeks another presentation from George Gula, the Laurel Line, Scranton to Wilkes Bar, Wilkes, however you want to say it. I've heard people say it like five different yeah. ways. Wilkes <laughs> Barra, Wilkes Barry, Wilkes Bar, um, and then uh, and then December eighth. Mike Salagi and Andrew McGinnis will present Schuylkill Railways trolleys through the Anthracite coal fields, which will be very exciting. We'll have some. Uh, Eastern PA presentations coming up. And I wanna thank everybody uh, for coming again. Um, if you can join us for Santa Trolley, which starts November 26th. And um, if you're a volunteer at the museum, we just sent out a uh, call for volunteers for, for Santa Trolley. So we're looking for all sorts of different positions. So check your email for um, an email from me today if you're one of our volunteers and sign up and help if you can. Um, thank you again to those who donated during the registration process tonight. We truly, truly appreciate it. And um, now at this time, I am going to make it so everyone can unmute themselves. Allow participants to unmute yourselves. You can also turn on your videos if you'd like. So I'll do that. 
And if I turned off your video, you might not be able to turn it on. So just let me know. But um, thank you, Dennis. I thought some of those um, photos were really, really fascinating, like um, particularly the ones of the waiting rooms, um, like the, the, the fans and the light bulbs. And yeah, that was really interesting. And well, um, didn't you say the other day, yesterday, that a friend of yours actually went to the power company in Cincinnati and bought their light bulbs and things from them because they got such a great price? Yes. And um, I think he said it's because they're, you know, incentivized to provide, um, you know, I'll have to ask him again, but incentivized to provide um, clean energy credits and energy efficient bulbs um, as, as a requirement or something like that. So um, he can pipe in if he wants, he's watching today. But um, yeah, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. So does uh, anyone have any questions? Yeah, comments? does anyone have any questions for Dennis? I thought I thought there was one of the amusement park photos that looked really interesting too. Um, if you wouldn't mind bringing it back up, um, I think you can share again. It was one of Grifflo Park and there were these like really interesting like swings or slides or something in the background. Um, <laughs> I don't remember what picture it was, but um, the trolley parks are really interesting. We're getting some really nice comments in the chat, by the way. Great. Dennis, I worked for uh, Philadelphia Electric for 31 years and we were still had the company stores selling appliances up until the early 90s. Wow, wow, that's cool. Yeah, we used to call it, we, we for employees, we could, you know, we would get payroll deduction. We used to call it the free store. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, I, one, of my, trips, one of my trips good. out to the power plant there at uh, at um, Keystone, I made a trip up to Apollo one time, but never knew the trolleys were there. I remember, I do have your book, and uh, but uh, when I was up there, I never never realized the trolleys were right up there. Yeah, yeah, there's, there, there's, well, the only thing that's left that you can see there is the over, the, the one overpass. Everything yeah. else is, I mean, you can, in the winter time, you can tell that the right of way was there, but that's it. And it's almost impossible to try to take a photograph of it from the highway because the highway is down below it. That's like when I took you up to the, the Doyle's town in Eastern. Was like, I'm guessing that the right, tracks were probably eventually paved over. Um, that they probably are still there and emerge every once in a while, or maybe they were removed. Do you know? Right, right. Uh, the, the tracks are gone on the private right of way. Yeah. Whether they're still, I'm not sure. I haven't been down to actually see any time they've done street work to see if they're still there. I imagine a lot of them are gone. <clears throat> there are still tracks in Ford City. I do know that. But any tracks in the private right of way up here don't exist. Yeah. And I see, I see Catherine's note that she worked an open car. Well, we, we demonstrated the trolley museum, but our, our policy here is that we don't do that. So, and you know that obviously, but it's, it's an interesting experience to walk along an open car yeah. and try to figure out what's going on. You know, if you look at this guy, you know, here, oh, we can't, uh, we, we can only see for some reason we're on the last slide. Um, oh. yeah. Hey, Dennis. Yes. Uh, it is possible with newspapers.com. During the war, a lot of streetcar track I know was lifted up for the steel. They might have an article about that in one of the papers. Right. The, the tough thing with this particular area is none of the, lo none, none of the little papers that were there exist. Uh, the local historical societies have some things. Uh, a lot of that area was covered by the Valley News over in Trenum, which is, that's still their newspaper today. There, there never seemed to be a giant push for strong news in that part of the county. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Dennis? Um, 
about the line or um I, I really like how I really love the street scenes. Um did you talk about I might have missed it, um, why there were no cars in any of those photos? I think you did, but I forgot what you said. Well, people didn't have cars. Yeah. There weren't that many cars at the turn of the twentieth century. Uh why buy a car when you don't need one? If you you live in town. You either walk to work or you ride the streetcar to work. You ride the streetcar to go shopping. You ride the streetcar to go to the amusement park. What else did you need? You had you had two towns you could shop in. So you had a variety there. Um, if you went to school, you rode the streetcar to school back and forth. There was a school in Apollo and there was a school in Leechburg. Uh, the high school in Leechburg is still in the same place. Apollo school has moved out of town. Uh, and a lot of other things have changed in Apollo too. The map, one of the maps, and I'll, I'll spend more time because I realize a lot of you aren't just that familiar with that area, but the way that you come into Apollo now from like Ray was saying, coming down from on Route 56, that route didn't exist at all back then. You went out of um, town on 2nd Street, not 1st Street. 1st Street is where the hotel was. I see. Um, Edward, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I just want to, uh, I've had both of Dennis's books and uh, they're wonderful. And I want to thank Dennis for the presentation and you for uh, hosting it. But uh, I have a, do have a question for Dennis. Uh, what was the number of cars that were usually used? You know, you, you usually see the roster, the whole West Penn. And, you know, you have this one little isolated segment. Okay, obviously they had one or two open cars at one time and we'll closed car 204, but... Just rough numbers. What else did they uh, sort of run uh, with? At first, from from the records we could piece together because we, we have some records and some things have just disappeared <clears throat> over the years. Uh, from what we could put together earlier, before they brought the before they brought the Stevenson cars that we saw the two hundred series cars, they had four or five op single truck open cars. Mm-hmm. And they probably, over the time period, they had about two work cars. They brought one, two, three, four, five of the Stevenson cars in. And that's what they used to run the service with. Uh, I think it was a half hour service. There was, there was a half hour headway. So they would have only needed two or three cars to run, to run service and keep a couple, you know, for spares in case something happens. Yeah. Th thank you, Dennis. And, uh... and and I just want to make a clarification. They're not my books. All the books that we've done, those those are all cl wonderful collaborations. Those are wonderful collaborations. I know. I I see Bruce sitting there, and uh, you know, I I really appreciate the work that he does for not only publications but for everything that we do at the museum. Um, but they're not they're not my books by any stretch. Okay. Of well. Okay. But thank you. Thank you. They, they are ex they are very nicely well executed books and I'm uh, glad I picked them up over the uh, last few years that I've been involved with the uh, PTM but, and we also encourage you to make sure to pick up the calendar every year because uh, we, already we... ordered but not yet received okay well you're gonna like the calendar for next year too okay. and uh, and Kristen uh, I hope you're noticing and I'm, I'm doing I'm not doing this to embarrass you Look carefully to see who's operating that trolley car behind me. Uh, uh, that might be me. <laughs> the hair uh, makes it look like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out, Edward. Um, I think Alan has a question. Alan. Well, not quite a question, but another reason for not owning a car. Remember, no, none of the roads were paved. Right. So that meant in the spring and fall, it was pure mud. In the winter, it was overgrown with, with uh, snow. And in the summertime, you got dust. Cars were not very reliable. They would break down. You didn't have cell phones. You didn't have uh, any way of communicating. And uh, finally, who had money for a car? Right. Those were luxury items for people who were rich. Yeah. If you made a dollar a day as a laborer, uh, you, you can barely live on that. So it's entirely reasonable. Uh, cars were, before Henry Ford and the Model T, cars were very expensive. 
Yeah. Exactly. And and you mentioned also this, you know, what did they do when it when it snowed? They brought out sleighs. And that's that's the reason why we, we started to see now it's interesting, as far as we know, the P and A V did not have a snow sweeper. Uh, the tanning line did. I guess they felt they were far enough south that they didn't need a snow sweeper. Uh, they didn't have quite the hill that Catanning had to deal with going up to Lenape Park. But the streetcar companies were responsible for keeping the streets clean. The towns had no reason to clean the snow off the streets because there were no cars. I think, uh, uh, Dennis, a lot of the towns at that time would actually have a large horse-drawn roller that when it snowed, they would tow the roller over the snow, compress it down, so it would be a better foundation for sleds and uh, lightweight wagons to uh, go over the compacted snow. Sure, sure. Um, I see Gary has raised his hand. Do you have a question or comment, Gary? Uh, yes. Was it all single rail line or was there a passing or some double track? There were, there were a couple of little passing sidings and a couple of little spurs, but that was it. And two cars were running. That, that was their. It's all they needed the most, was two for cars. For the most part, they were running two cars. Yeah, it's not. It's only the line's only eight miles long. That's right. I forgot that. What did I ask that to? Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Ah. Uh, Jim Gravener has his hand up. Uh, <clears throat> Dennis, I wanted to come back to the roster for a minute, both with that line and with the line to the south there, um, in the section I wrote in my book on Jewett, we have evidence pointing to the existence of a Jewett car on one of those two lines, believe it or not. And I just wondered whether you had any reports or anything, and you said the newspapers weren't too reliable at that point, but um, I wondered if you had anything that could confirm or deny that. Two lines, you're talking about the P and AV or the Allegheny Valley? Or... Yeah, the, the two, uh, the other line between um, Leechburg. As far as we know, I don't ha we don't have anything listed in the roster from Jewett. We did have, other than the Stevensons, there were some St. Louis Car Company okay. coast cars also uh, that were that pre that were predecessors to the to the Stevens. double truck cars. Yeah. Right offhand, I don't remember, and I don't have my notes with me from the Allegheny Valley. Bruce, do you remember okay. if Bruce is still? I'm not sure if Bruce is still here. I don't think Bruce. Yeah, is I'm here. here. I just uh, oh. a view. Do you uh, remember no. if there was a? No, no. I just, I mean, that was 1994. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Understand. Been been there, done that. Yeah, I remember the latest book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not the not that one. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for trying, guys. I guess I can put that one to bed. It's, yeah. it's, well, you know, you know how it is trying to dig up these records. Boy, I do. Yeah. It, it, I know we went, we went round and round and round trying to look things down when we were working on the Allegheny Valley book, especially yeah. for the Trenum, the Trenum Brack, Bird, Brackenridge and Butler. <laughs> that was just, it was just crazy just trying to figure that out. Yep. And sometimes you can't even rely on the newspapers. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. They, they, they write anything they wanted. They'd call it anything yep. they wanted to just to, just to call it something. Yep. And, you know, company records were destroyed. Company records were thrown away. Companies just, a lot of times companies just went out of business nice and quietly. They just kind of, let's, let's mm -hmm. forget about this and move on. And that seemed, you know, they, I have heard rumors and I keep hearing this persistent rumor um, and I have someone trying to track it down for me that there's actually a Catanning car somewhere in Armstrong County. <laughs> it's built well, inside of a house and the only place you can tell yeah. that it's a street car is by going into these people's basement and looking up underneath of it. I've seen a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I ever find it, I'll take some photographs and we'll, we'll try to do some more digging, but who knows? Who yeah. Knows? yeah. Well, so thanks. Like for a history effort. detective story. Yeah, <laughs> right. I've got I've got both of your books and they're both excellent. So 
Well, thanks thank for writing. We, we enjoy, I enjoy working with, with the people at the museum. It's, it's a wonderful place. For those of you who don't happen to volunteer there, it's, it's a wonderful place to go and hang out. It is. It's a beautiful museum, too. Yes, yes. I'm very proud of all the work that everyone has done there. Yeah, agreed. Thanks. It's a great place, and the new archives will even make it better. The new archives building. Yes. That's true. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Dennis? I see. Oh, uh, Lon. Yes. Um, I was just looking at uh, Benson Rohrbach's Pennsylvania Street Railways, and it mentioned that uh, the line offered 40 minute service and it was a 35 minute run time. But wouldn't you think with all the mills along the line, there would have been, you know, high demand at shift change time? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't they have had to have rush hour service? <laughs> you would think so, but I mean, the schedules that I've seen don't show anything like that. Okay. I, I'm looking at my wall because I have one of the schedules up here on the wall, and it they are, they they didn't let comp, now what they may have done was do like a double tripper. Sure. Mm -hmm. you know, just, like, just like we saw the picture with them at the amusement park. They, mm -hmm. they may have run two cars at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. But from the pictures you presented, suggested that some of the steel mills uh, disappeared a little bit on the early side. Right. Right. Uh, the population, looking at the population numbers, uh, the population numbers actually started dropping down there in 1940, which is mm -hmm. the, the peak population for that area was 1930 as far as the census goes and so things things dried up pretty quickly and then all kinds of crazy things happened bet between you know there's a there's a, a nuclear waste site along this line that you're still been trying to clean up for 50 years mm -hmm. uh, they were processing some uranium and some things in parks township and it's just it's still been a battle with with residents down there trying to get it cleaned up uh, but our county is losing population. We don't have the infrastructure. Everything should be here to, to make this area grow. Uh, I can be in downtown Pittsburgh in 45 minutes from here without having to go through any tunnels. <laughs> and I only have to cross one bridge to get to downtown. But we don't have water lines and sewage lines and things like that out into the general area. Uh, I know I hadn't been at the museum for a year because of COVID. And when I came down for the fair, I was just amazed at the number of houses that have been built down there. Nothing like that's ever happened around here. Uh, if there's 10 houses built a year in the county, that's probably a lot. Hmm. Uh, as, as my friend, as my friend Ray says, I live in heaven <laughs> or I live in paradise. <laughs> it is nice here. It's nice. It's quiet. Uh, don't pay attention. If you've, if you've seen us in the news recently, uh, we're all embarrassed. We're all embarrassed about the, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look up female hockey player and you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll see what happened. Uh, it, it was pretty bad. Um, so back to the towns, you said the, there was a canal, um, an early That's canal, an right? And the first way to get across Pennsylvania was the Pennsylvania Canal. You went and by, you basically by railroad from Philadelphia, close to Harrisburg. You got onto a canal boat and you went from there the whole way to Hollidaysburg. And then they pulled the canal boat up out of the water and took up over the inclined plains, up over the Allegheny Mountains, put it back down the other side over several more inclined plains. There's a great museum that describes all of that. And then put the canal boat back in the water uh, near Blairsville. And it followed the Lohanna and the, the Kanama and the Kiskaminitis. And the most, the most famous visitor probably to ever visit Armstrong County was Charles Dickens, because Charles Dickens rode the Pennsylvania Canal from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. And so he actually came through the southern part of our county in the 1850s and talks about it. He talks about the ride in his book called American Notes. 
Uh, he I, wasn't I, terribly impressed with it with the canal system. I think that was called the main line of public works. Right, right. In the eastern. Oh. Are and, there, are... And, and the Pennsylvania Railroad put that out of business pretty quickly. Once, mm -hmm. once the railroad was finished uh, over the mountains. You said there's a little bit of evidence of, the of the canal. You can still see part of the canal in Leechburg. Uh, there's there's a, there's a nice ditch along the river that <laughs> you go down by the Italian Club, and there's 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 a ditch before you get to the river. So, well, something else to see in Armstrong County other than trees and <laughs> trees and leaves <laughs> and all that kind of fun stuff. It's a nice <laughs> place. It's a, part of the tourist bureau. It's a nice place to live. I know, it's so uh, the line was originally intended to connect to uh, the the Allegheny Valley. The, the southern, the P and A V was going to connect to the Allegheny Valley. Uh, the Allegheny Valley was originally going to go to Freeport, and then mm -hmm. head north towards Catanning. The K and L, the Catanning and Leechburg, was going to come down and connect to the P A V. The Catanning and Leechburg was also had plans of going out Cow and Shannon Creek to home in Indiana County and attaching, connecting to the Indi some of the Indiana Street railways and going into Indiana. They had plans of going to East Break. They had plans of, we all know what, you read the early history of these places. There were thousands of paper companies that never came into existence. Mm -hmm. They, they yeah. created the paperwork and that was it. Uh, so sometimes trying to do the research of figuring out the beginnings of these things, it's, you just pull your hair out figuring, who did what, when, where, and how. Uh, well, we know that, you know, we've said many times that at the, at the end of the 20, 19th century, having a trolley line in your town was the equivalent of having your town having a website today. You couldn't imagine having a business or having any kind of an entity without a website. Well, these people couldn't imagine not having a trolley line because it was suddenly an easier way to get around. The steam railroads were just not convenient at all. They, just, um, they, they weren't they weren't convenient to close travel going distances wonderful yes <laughs> did they build the entire eight miles at once or was were there ever extension pretty, no it, it was pretty much built at once okay it was pretty much built well they, they hired a construction company they came in and put it in i mean there was there wasn't a whole lot to do because they weren't dealing, they didn't have to build any bridges. They didn't have to go over any bridges. Uh, there was a little bit of a fight over right of way with the Pennsylvania Railroad at the beginning, but we know that, the, you know, the Pennsylvania Railroad pretty much liked to fight with every trolley company they could. Uh, they wanted to have, the, they wanted to have the control of the right of ways. It's interesting that some cities, some towns uh, issued, uh, sold postcards with trolley lines on it that they had drawn in or photoshopped, or the equivalent. They never had a streetcar line, but they, they put that in. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Why not? Who's, who's going who's gonna to say also? Like, people didn't travel exactly. that far, for the most part. <laughs> and one other thing that was interesting, the Washington Old Dominion Railroad was one of the last steam railroads to be electrified as an interurban. And for some reason, they removed the overhead wires to make themselves look like an electric railroad that didn't have an overhead wire or third rail. Uh, it's hard to understand what was sinful about an overhead wire, but in any event, uh, it was dieselized about 1940 and it was ripped up for, believe it or not, two highways. Yeah. Well, we've seen that over and over and over again of just where, wouldn't it be nice to have a streetcar line? You know, the people in Westchester right now are hoping to get the railroad re rebuilt so that yeah. something can actually run the whole way out to Westchester. I don't know how many times I've ridden, driven in Route 3 from Westchester. My my wife is from that area. I said, boy, would it be fun to be running a, like a, a Louis car over these roads to kind of go like this, the whole, <laughs> going back in towards Philly. And I'm sure people would love to have that transportation now, but it's expensive. And it only took them about 10 years to build the highway after the trolley line was ripped up to Westchester. Yeah. And they finally finished it. Mm -hmm. All right. Other... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. In the Washington area, they're going to widen Interstate 270 to 16 lanes. <laughs> and 
at the beginning of the process, there was a lot of talk about building a subway extension, Metro. Then it became light rail. Then it became bus. Uh, the option of a commuter line, the, the mark to put extra tracks down. And the governor refused to do anything. There'll be nothing but 16 lanes. By the time they get it finished, it'll be just as crowded. When they went from six lanes to 12 lanes, in one year, the number of cars doubled on that portion during rush hour. The only way you're gonna solve this is with, with heavy rail or light rail. Buses don't attract people for some reason. No, uh, I did some looking around quite a few years ago and I think peak bus ridership in this country was in the early 1950s, something like that. I mean, I could be I could be wrong trying to remember back, but okay. people people don't want to people don't want to ride buses, um, mm. and it took us too long to figure out that you know streetcar systems were designed to bring people into town, and they didn't go from neighborhood to across neighborhood like you couldn't go from the west side of Pittsburgh easily to the north side. Or anywhere else without having to go into town first and when they replace them with buses what did they do they just put the buses on the same street car routes only on the roads and everything's still focused into town and so being able to get people to move cars became more prevalent and um it's just crazy i remember a, a friend of ours said that he worked for the Port Authority and he was at a meeting one time in downtown Pittsburgh and someone looked out the window and said, you know, boy, wouldn't the traffic be great if we got rid of all those buses out there? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is a small, the, the one advantage of living where I live is we don't have traffic. I drove seven miles to work and it took me 10 minutes to get there. Uh, that was on a bad day. So, but these little charter companies talking to old timers, who people who rode them, they were they were wonderful sources of news. People because you knew everybody. You were going to like one of the gentlemen was saying, you know, you went to work every day at the same time, and so everybody you knew everybody on the streetcar, and you were going to sit down and visit. What's happening? There was no radio yet. There might have been some local little newspapers, but who knows? And so the best way to was was gossip. Imagine sitting down in any public transit forum today and start talking to someone else other than on a train. You know, you get into an airplane, you get into a public bus, something like that. People don't want to talk to you. You sit down and talk to them, they're going to think you're crazy. I rode, I rode public transit to and from work for 36 years. I rode the, uh, pardon me, all 38 years. 36 years on the subway. And... For most of that time, we got a partial or full transit benefit, so it didn't cost me anything. And this was the United States Coast Guard. I was a civilian. And the military kept on telling me that I was wasting my money. It was cheaper to drive. Yeah. Of course, it cost $100 or more per month to park. They didn't include that. Right. And mm -hmm. finally, when I told them it cost me 10 cents a day over the subsidy, they said it's cheaper to drive. I've never understood that. I can understand saying I want to be by myself. I don't want people around me. I don't want to go underground, anything. But I've never understood why they did that. And I would ask them, why do you say that? It's 10 cents. You can't drive 10 miles for 10 cents and park for $100 a month. No, no. I have, I have no clue now what the IRS allowance is. I know when I retired from teaching, it was about 53 cents a mile something like that. Uh, I'm sure it's, I, I retired in 2008, so I'm sure it's gone up a good bit since then. Uh, but I, I also equate some of it to, we love our independence. And what, what better sign do you have of independence is the fact that you can get out and get in your car, even though it's gonna cost everybody more money, and go when you wanna go, where you wanna go, and come back when you wanna go, and be nice and isolated. You know, I think the first thing that happened when the pandemic set in, you couldn't buy a motorhome because everybody wanted to travel in their own little hotel rooms. 
And I think that's, that's, it's all this idea of independence to a great extent that we fight public transit as much as we can. All right. Dennis, Dennis. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Did the mills not work around the clock? I see no lights on the cars, no headlights. Well, they would have run around the clock. These companies only put their lights on at night. Lights were the headlights were removable on a lot of these early cars, and they they didn't bother they didn't run. And even you look at pictures, even in the forties and fifties, streetcars in Pittsburgh, right, Bruce? They, they, were, they didn't run the lights on during the daytime, did they? No, Philly didn't. Philadelphia didn't. Yeah, the, the West Bend didn't. Uh, you know, they they hung all their headlights on the cars. You know, even you know the Cottlesville Union time lights. Uh, you know, they didn't run with the headlight hung on the car during the day. Yeah. Yeah. If a question about Pittsburgh is uh, is possible here, what's the latest news on the library route rebuild or scrapping? Hasn't been anything I've heard. Not the newspapers. Yeah. That would make news. Yeah, I think they're going to have another fight like they did when they tried to bring in the sky bus. When they try, repeat, please. Well, when they tried to to take over the the right of ways for the streetcars that were already operating on the private right of ways with sky bus, there was a huge hue and cry from the Bethel Park area. So, the library line is a primarily a Bethel Park route, and you know. I would think that that's going to, that would be hard for them to sell, but you never know. You know, there's uh, rumors about the shaker, uh, the shaker lines being turned in bike trails because nobody rides them anymore. And, uh, you know, but that hasn't happened yet either, I guess. All righty. Um, I think that is, uh, for that. about wrapping that <laughs> i think we should wrap it up there uh any last minute questions or comments for dennis thank you dennis thank you christian and have a good evening wonderful evening. thank you all for coming thanks again dennis uh hope oh, we thank can you all this. thanks thanks to all of you and christian for all of your hard work of of helping to organize this people don't understand what she does behind the scenes to do this but it's fun it's fun. I enjoy, I enjoy, and it's great to see all of you again, or at least your names. I can see <laughs> some of you, some of you turned your videos back on, some of you did not. So, but thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, remember to visit patrolley.org uh, or patrolley.org slash trolleyology if you want to see what's coming up next. And I hope you guys can join us in the coming weeks or months on Zoom, and we'll see you next time. Have a great evening. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye, goodbye.